Let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 5. We're looking tonight at Genesis 5 and 6, Lord willing, title of our study, From Adam to Noah. Our study begins with the genealogy of the original Adam's family, takes us from Adam to Noah, and it takes us through the godly line of Seth. Why is that important to us? Because the first children of Adam and Eve were disqualified for bringing forth the, the promises of God. Uh, one was disqualified because his brother killed him. The other was disqualified because he's the one who killed his brother. So uh, Abel dies with no descendants. Cain's descendants, by the way, will be wiped out in the flood. So we're following the godly line as much as they could be called godly, still sinners like us, still in need of salvation. But we're following the line of Seth. And we're going to see some really cool things, Lord willing, at the very end of our study. And, uh, and, and I really do mean Lord willing in this one. So this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. Usually when you read those words, you're like, okay, not for me. Genealogy, not for me. This one's very important. And it's short, so you can hang with me. In it and on it. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them, male and female, and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. God reminds us here that he created Adam and Eve. They were made by him. They were made like him. They were made for him. Verse 3, one result of their sin. Adam lived 130 years, and he begot a son. So if you're, you know, getting older and you're like, you know, I don't know, another kid? 130, first son, in his own likeness after his image, and named him Seth. Adam was created, as Eve was, in the image of God. But Seth was born... In the image of his father, what's the difference? God is sinless. Adam was created sinless. God is pure and holy and perfect in every way. Adam and Eve were that for a season. But once they rebelled, once they fell, once they sinned, everything changed. And this is one of the changes. We'll see more. So uh, he, Seth, his name means appointed, and I'll kind of give you that as we walk through, and we'll come back to it at the end. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. This will be the first. We'll read those words in almost every single case. We're introduced to someone, we're told how long they lived till they produced an offspring, then we're told how they lived, how long they lived afterward, and ultimately the story ends and they died, exposing the devil's lie. What did he say? Did God say, as he spoke to Eve, you're not to eat of the fruit of the tree? She says, oh, not j just one tree. He ultimately calls God a liar and, and how crazy is it for the father of lies to call the one who never lies a liar? I've noticed that people who are thieves tend to think you're probably a thief too. Why? Because they can't imagine somebody who wouldn't take something if they could get away with it. But I don't think you're thieves. I don't think you're liars. I don't think anything negative of you. I know you're not perfect, but, but I know that you don't have to be guilty of any of those things because we have a choice in it and the power to overcome it, even if we were tempted to do it. So anyway, his sin exposes the devil's lie. The devil said, you won't die. This says, and he died. All sin, so all die. Seth is uh, mentioned there in verse 6. It's already been mentioned in verse 3. 
But we move from Adam to Seth, because Seth replaces um, Cain and Abel, as neither of them are Abel. <laughs> one of them's Abel, but, you know, not, not the kind of Abel we needed. <laughs> Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, which means mortal, Seth lived 807 years, had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. Sorrow, his name means. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. You're sort of starting to get the rhythm of this. It's almost like it's a song, and the chorus is always the same, and he died. Short chorus, but um, long lives. Have you noticed so far? When we get through these, the average lifespan prior to the days of Noah, over 900 years. Pretty amazing. Well, next up, uh, he mentioned Canaan whose name means sorrow. He lives, verse 12, 70 years, and begot Mahaliel, the blessed God. That means, that was the last, God is the L on the end. And so it's Mahaliel. After he begot Mahaliel, Canaan lived 840 years. He had sons and daughters, so all the days of Canaan were 900 and 10 years, and he died. Mahaliel lived 65 years and begot Jared. Jared means shall come down. After he begot Jared, Mahaliel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters, so all the days of Mahaliel were 895 years, and he died. Aren't you glad we're only looking at a short group of this? Could you imagine like an hour of that? It would be good for napping. But nevertheless, it's all here. And here's why. Every one of these people were important to God. And even in those massive genealogies in the Chronicles and elsewhere, every person there important to God. That means we're important even if no one else knows it or thinks it or cares about us, he does. But these people are important because they are in the genealogy of Jesus. And when you see Luke's gospel, which traces all the way back to Adam, you'll find these people. So they're related personally to Jesus, physically, tangibly, to our Lord and Savior, who became one of us, lived among us, died for us, buried, and risen again. Well, Jared lived 162 years, verse 18, and he begot Enoch. His name means teaching. And after he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were, for ni were 962 years, and he died. Now, so far, we're batting 100%. They live and they die. They live and they die. They live and they die. The one exception recorded for us here is Enoch. Enoch never dies. Enoch lived, verse 21, and you should be reading along with me at this point because this part is pretty important to us. Enoch lived 65 years. He begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. His name means teaching, and that's fitting because he is teaching through example how we can live forever. He walked with God, in fellowship with God, in harmony with God, no doubt in obedience to God. He walked with God and was not. Now, he's the first to beat the odds because up to this point, 100% of sinners, well, they died. But all of a sudden, here's a sinner who doesn't die. A few have joined him since, but millions will join him soon. 
as the last generation, that generation that, that hears the trumpet blow and, and the dead in Christ rise first, we who are alive and remain at that point will be caught up together with them and more importantly with him. And it, it says we'll be with him forever. We know we're going to spend seven years up there it, adoring the Father, falling on our faces and uh, casting our crowns at Jesus' feet, singing holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty as we often do already. But we will sing perfectly, perfect tune, perfect harmony, perfect everything. And so, I mean, figure it, think about it. We have auto-tune now. If we have that, certainly God can fix stuff, right? He's got to be better at all this than we are. So he, he, Enoch, first to beat the odds. Uh, The rapture, we will see millions join him. But the explanation for his miraculous survival is surprisingly simple. Enoch walked with God. That's the key. It's an example for every one of us, and it says, he was not for God took him. Hebrews 11.5 clarifies, by faith, Enoch was taken up so he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he had taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it's impossible to please him for he who comes to him must believe that he is That would mean that he is God and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 11.5, by faith Enoch was taken away. Oh, it's it's just great. By faith Enoch was taken away. The word comes from two Greek words that speak to a change of place, position, or condition. Uh, In music, it would be transposing, and the word is actually used of transpose. So that means to to change the key, if you will. And um, and so uh, when it comes to goods and people, it's to uh, transport or to transfer. In language, it would be the word um, translate. This word is used in all those ways in the Greek language, and that's the language of the New Testament. So you could say he was transposed, he was transported, he was transferred, he was translated. But what happened is he went from just like everyone else, a sinner in the sight of a holy God, to walking with God, to pleasing God, and then God just says, hey, you're coming home with me, and you're coming home Today, we talk about those who the Lord has taken as if we've lost something or they may have lost something. Listen, it's all gain for the one who goes. And though we may grieve those who go before us, that's, you know, I I get that. I've had many die who I loved and still do and expect to see again. But we're told not to grieve as those who have no hope. And I'll read you why in just a moment. So he was taken away, so he did not see death. That was the result of being transposed, transported, transferred, and translated. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We used to have that on the nursery. But uh, that, that sign, anyway, it makes, makes sense. Some of you will catch it later and and you'll wake up laughing so um anyway we'll not all sleep we'll all be changed that means in form and in nature in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet i already mentioned this the trumpet will sound the dead will be raised incorruptible perfected and we shall be changed also incorruptible and perfected that's what happened to Enoch. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who've fallen asleep. Lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. If we believe Jesus died and rose again, and we believe that, right? Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Then he says, I tell you again, 
by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who've fallen asleep. I quoted this earlier. Now I'm reading it to you or reading and quoting. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, the voice of an archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. That's what happened to him. He was caught up to be with the Lord. And thus we shall always be with the Lord in that passage. And you should be familiar with it ends with these words. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. If you've lost someone, if you're losing someone, comfort one another with these words. Well, Methuselah is next on our hit parade. His name is an interesting one. It means his death shall bring. Shall bring what? Tell you in a minute. He lived 187 years, verse 25, and begot Lamech. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. So we're back to the norm. We live and we die. In between, we make decisions that determine where we spend eternity. Lamech means the despairing. Lamech lived, verse 28, 182 years and had a son. He called his name Noah, saying, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. And after he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. Noah means rest, by the way. Noah means comfort. That's why they said he will comfort us. And we read in verse 32, he was 500 years old and Noah begot Shem. Ham, and Japheth. Now, we won't find Noah joining the others in death tonight, not till we get to Genesis 9, because there's a lot more to his story than God chose to share with us regarding the others. But in Genesis 9, verse 28, we'll read this. Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So if you're new to this, spoiler alert, there's going to be a flood. And he lives after the flood. He lives before the flood, up to 500 years. He has kids. Then there's some time in between. He lives another 350 years. So all the days of Noah, when we get to verse 29 of Genesis 9, were 950 years and he died. Well, It's called the gospel in plain sight, and we're not going to look at it yet, but we will look at it at the end of our time together. But look at chapter 6. If you're like, how are we going to get through all that? We're through it. And now it's actually, that was the good part, unfortunately, because, you know, there's some really bad news that follows. But the good news is God never gives us bad news without giving us good news. And he'll give us some bad, then he'll give us some good Then he'll say, but, and give us the bad, and then he'll say, but, then he'll give us the good. So chapter 6, verse 1 says, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now to me, this seems clear and simple if we take it at face value. The population increases. The sons of God, or descendants in this case of Seth, because he has the godly line that leads to our Lord and Savior Jesus. Those sons of God, um, they begin to intermarry with the descendants of Cain. That's going to be a problem. However, there are those some who I greatly admire and respect, who who for one reason or another interpret the sons of God here to mean fallen angels. 
And the idea is they're saying the fallen angels took wives. They married the daughters of men. And, well, then they produced offspring. They cite the fact that in a moment we'll read that there were giants and mighty men in the land. Uh, verse 4, the idea is the offspring of these hybrid beings were different. Now, I would never want to disrespect people to whom I have great admiration for. And so I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to make fun of that view. I'm just going to say I don't believe that view to be true. I think the simple explanation of this is the correct explanation. And so here's a couple thoughts, just three things to chew on. Most of you are probably thinking, you know, if you never mentioned this, we would have never known about it, so it wouldn't have been a problem. And that may be true, but if you're confronted by someone who says, did you know that angels came down and had sex with women, and that's why the giants like Goliath were on the planet? And you can say, yeah, I heard about that, but I don't know. And you'll have to decide for yourself, because I'm not saying, hey, you have to believe it, because I believe it, but I believe it. And, and, uh, and so here, I'll give you three reasons. First, to say that giants must have resulted from angels impregnating women begs the question, why are there giants today? And, and who's impregnating them, right? If that's what was going on then, then wouldn't giants be still coming about in that way? And if you're saying, well, there aren't even giants today, listen, very short and extremely tall people are often born to just, well, what would we call them? Couples of average height. And so, you know, Andre the Giant, I don't know if you've seen him, Shaquille O'Neal. I mean, there's a whole bunch of people out there. And they're big people like Goliath. And so I don't think that it's any, it says, okay, well, it had to be because where would we get giants or men of renown? There have always been men who exalted themselves of all of all sizes, I'm pretty sure that, ne I was going to call him Neapolit Neapolitan, but Napoleon, he wouldn't have liked that. That would have been an off with your head offense. He, he, I don't think, was any kind of giant. And so anyway, uh, second thing is, up to this point, this might be the most important thing, everything God created reproduced after its own kind. That's important. Because he created everything to reproduce after its own kind. There's nowhere he tells us that angels are able to reproduce, nor is there anywhere where he says angels can be redeemed. They're a different species. And everything he created, he said, was good. And everything he created, he made it possible for it to reproduce, but only after its own kind. So we don't read anywhere of that changing. And I'm certain personally, if it had happened, God would have clearly said so and warned us about it. You know what he does warn us about? He, he warns them about intermarriage with unbelieving heathen. And even in the church, we're not to be unequally yoked. He's not saying that you can't ma marry someone of a dif different ethnicity or, or of a different background or, or, no, he's talking about a believer marrying someone who's an unbeliever. And if you love unbelievers, share Christ with them. Share Christ with a lot of them. And if they come to the Lord, well, then they're marrying material. But, but we're told not to be unequally yoked. And, and the idea here is there was lots of warning and serious judgments for their disregarding it when they go into the promised land they intermarry with the people of the land who turn their hearts away from the true and living God to worship the idols that were being worshipped in the land before God tried to get rid of those people in the first place. Well, verse 3, The Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, that might sound like, wow, people were living over 900 average lifespan, and now only 120. It sounds bad to some of you. It sounds good to me. Because that means if his intention was 120 years, and I play my cards right, I'm just a little past middle age, <laughs> 60s middle age. and Well, I guess I'm a little more past 
middle age, but nevertheless, it's a hopeful prophecy and a hopeful uh, revelation to uh, such as me. So, um, what do we see? Uh, the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive. We dealt with that. Um, 120. Mm. Anyway, so um, the Lord saw the wickedness. Oh, giants in the earth. We read that, right? Verse 4. Every now and then I'll look at this. I'll look away. I'll look back and I'll be like, well, where'd those notes come from? And I realize, oh, wait, I wrote those. So verse 4 says there were giants on the earth. In those days, and afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children to them. They were mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Goliath was such a man. His brothers were giants too. They were mighty. They were famous. So the Lord saw that the wickedness of man, verse 5, was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is why God flooded the earth. This is why God destroyed every living being. Because the crown of his creation, man, had turned from him the intentions and thoughts of his heart, only evil continually. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us, and listen, this is important because it's not talking about them, it's talking about everyone The heart is deceitful above all things and deceitfully or desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, he says, search the heart. I test the mind. I give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. That's the bad news. Every heart, he says, is deceived and deceitful. But Ezekiel 18.30 says this, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you've committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die? O house of Israel, for I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Turn, that's repent. Go in the wrong way, turn around. Think in the wrong stuff, think right. Living in the darkness, come into the light. Even more, Ezekiel 36, 25. God makes some promises. He says, then I'll sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I'll give you a new heart and put my spirit, a new spirit within you. I'll take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Now, this is important For any of you who would be thinking, wait a minute, those are clearly promises to Israel. And we're the church. We've learned Israel's Israel, the church is the church. Clear distinction throughout the scripture about that. But listen, there's always only been one savior. Those who died in faith in the Old Testament died believing God would raise up a savior who would atone for their sins. And Jesus is that Savior. Those who die in the New Testament die looking back at the cross because there's always been one means of salvation. The law would have been able to save if anyone could keep it, but no one ever did. And so it could have kept people from sin, but people still sin. So for those who'd say this is for Israel, not for the church, it's their promised Messiah. He is but he's our Lord and Savior. He's their promised atonement. He's ours through the cross. That's the only way Israel can be saved through the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That was Peter's message, by the way, to a group of Jews and proselytes to the the religion that God gave to them, that the relationship through um, coming to Christ. So anyway, our hearts no less wicked than theirs. 
The promise of his cleansing and a new heart, a new spirit belong to us just as it does to them. Anyone who believes Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection and the life, the only door that no one comes to the Father but by him. Listen, for Jew and Gentile, he is mankind's only hope. And uh, in case you're unaware, Jew and Gentile, that's all there is from, you know, when God's looking down. He saw Jews, he saw Gentiles, then he made a third group, That's who we are naturally. The third is the church. Jews must be part of the church. Gentiles must become a part of the church. You can't join it. You you have to be born into it. And he calls that being born again. Been born of flesh, you must be born of spirit. Well, verse 6 says, The Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created, From the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I love that so much, because we know, of course, saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any should boast, But we're his workmanship, he goes on to say, created in Christ Jesus for good works, pre-planned before the foundation of the world itself. He says, I'm at my end, but Noah finds grace. Everyone's going to perish, but Noah finds grace. This is the genealogy, verse 9, of Noah. He begins to describe Noah for us. And we'll camp on him because there's only another 10 or 11 verses. But but listen, first it says he was just. To be just in the sight of God means that you're doing what's right in his eyes. No one can be justified by works. No one can be justified through the law. We're justified by faith. That word, by the way, we have a play on words that comes from it. When you're in Christ, now that I'm in Christ, because it works better with an I, God deals with me just as if I'd never sinned. That's true for every one of you. That's what it means to be justified by him. And so when it says he was just, it it means that God had justified him because no one is just apart from that work of God. Perfect in his generations. Of all the people who were living, he was the one person who was responding just how God wanted him to. Well, Enoch did pretty good as well because Enoch's hanging with God and he missed the whole death thing. So, you know, that's kind of batting a thousand. And uh, Noah, though, just perfect in his generations. It doesn't mean sinless. It means that when God called him on his sin, he repented of it. He confessed it. He turned from it because no one's been sinless since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Everyone was born a sinner and proves it through acts of sin. Noah walked with God. I like that. And remember, Enoch walked with God and God took him. But Noah walked with God and God left him. Why? He had work for him to do. And those are the only two things that we should expect as we walk with God. He's either going to take us to be with him or he's going to leave us here to work for him, to walk with him and represent him. Either way, either way, the, the, the bottom line is being what God's called us to be, doing what God's called us to do, and what he most wants from us is a tight and close and personal relationship with us. So Noah's just perfect in his generations. He stands above the others because he walks in obedience to the Lord. He walked with God and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now we're going to camp on them, get a lot more from them in our next study and perhaps a little beyond because their descendants, these three men, will populate the whole earth, repopulate the whole earth after the flood. And uh, you can read ahead to verify that. Don't take my word for it. Be a Berean. 
Make sure that you receive the word with readiness in mind, then search the scriptures daily to see if those things are so. So, let's see. The earth, verse 11, was corrupt before God. He mentioned that a little earlier. The earth was filled with violence. I just want to say, you know, I was going to say, if you're reading the paper, but is anybody actually reading the paper? I can't understand how they're still publishing it. But if you're looking at the news at all and whatever medium you find it, well, the earth is still corrupt before God and it's still filled with violence. It's not like we're an improved generation. We're more like that generation, I think, than any before us. So it's arguable. So, so, uh, But I will read you something toward the end of this before we get to the really good thing. And, and that, that, that shows that, well, we're very much a, a generation like the generation he flooded out. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Wages of sin is death. Their corruption led to their destruction. He instructs then Noah to make an ark of gopher wood. First mention of the ark. And he says, make rooms in the ark. Cover it inside and outside with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of it, 300 cubits, because most of us don't deal in cubits. It's supposed to be the distance from your elbow to your fingers, or about, what what do they say? 18 inches or something like that. I don't know how that works if if it's like me standing next to somebody in the NBA who's seven feet tall. I mean, I'm going to work on my side, and they're going to work on their side, and it's going to be like this. So, but, but anyway... He tells them this is how tall it's going to be, 300 cubits. It's width 50, it's height 30. You'll make a window for the ark. You'll finish it to the cubit from above, to a cubit from above. Set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. So this is made as sort of a a cruise ship uh, type of thing, although I'm pretty sure the luxury of a current cruise ship would far, you know, surpass it. But if in a flood, you know, any old boat. So, so uh, behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall go into the ark, you and your sons, and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort in the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Simple question, but one not everyone would have the answer to today. I would think all of you would. Why male and female of every species? of every type, so they could do what? Yeah, that's right, procreate, reproduce. Because after the flood, you're going to need a lot more animals. They're bringing two. We'll find there were some they bring in by sevens. That'll be next time. And there are good reasons for it. But he says they'll be ma- they shall be male and female so they can reproduce ATF. What's ATF? After the flood. So new meaning for ATF when you hear it. Um, Of the birds after their kind. Hear, Hear those words again. Everything he created he made to reproduce after its own kind. Read that again and again and again and again in the Old Testament. uh, In the earlier parts of this particular book. But here of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, of every creeping thing on the earth after its kind, too, of every kind. And um, listen, he answers a question that sometimes people ask, and that's, well, how to get all those animals on the ark? It says, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. 
Turns out, animals have a sense of impending danger. And God can talk to the animals. And, well, you know what? In Isaiah, he says, everything and everyone listens to the Lord. The donkey knows its crib and, and the ox its master. You know, who's feeding it? Where to come for, for dinner? But he says, my people, they're clueless. And, and, and so only mankind is in rebellion to God. Well, and Satan and his crew. But, but apart from that, the animal kingdom, submission. And he's the one who says so. Check it out, Isaiah 1. You'll find it. If it's not in Isaiah 1, just keep reading until you find it. Somewhere there. It's only 66 chapters, so you'll find it. Uh, anyway. Of the birds after their kind, animals after their kind, creeping things after their kind, of two of every kind, they'll come to you to keep them alive. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten. You shall gather it to yourself. It shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him. So he did. That's the secret, you see, of Noah's success. Whatever God said to do, he did it. Whatever God commanded him to do, he did it. And by the way, it will be the key for your success and for mine. In every relationship, it starts with just being obedient to him, knowing what he says about this, and then rather than debating it or even discussing it, just saying, well, this is what the Lord says about it. Let's just be doers of the word and not hearers only. Two Two quick references, and then we'll throw something up there for you. Luke 17, 22, he says to the disciples, the days will come when you desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they'll say, look here, or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part of under heaven, so also will the Son of Man be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Listen to that again. It's going to be like the days of Noah. Now, we know the days of Noah were so wicked. He said, I got to flood it all. I'm going to kill it all, but I'm going to save Noah and his family, and I'm going to save a couple of everything that I've created so that, well, they can repopulate the earth, and we can give it another try. But the, he doesn't, as Jesus shares about the days of Noah, he doesn't mention the depravity and, and the wickedness of every heart, the violence that filled the land. He says it will just be business as usual. That's troubling, you see, because for most people, everybody's not out there being violent. There's violence. Everybody's not living a, a totally wicked, depraved life. There's wickedness and depravity. But, but he's saying the, the majority will be just busy about their daily routine, eating, drinking, everybody does. Marrying wives, given in marriage. That's what was happening then. They were disregarding the warnings. They were disregarding what was going on with Noah. He was a preacher of righteousness, we're told in the New Testament. But they weren't listening to the message until the day Noah entered the ark, the flood came and destroyed them all. Hebrews 11:7 7 says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear. He prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. I mentioned that there's... A, the gospel hidden in plain view. And if we have the slide, and if we do, I'll be very happy. And if not, well, I'll just read it to you. Oh, we have it. Miracle of miracles. Well done, good and faithful servant. Um, listen, 
Here, here, here's the gospel in the genealogy from Adam to Noah. Because as we went through, I read you the meaning of their names. So I'll read you each name and the meaning. Then I'll just read you the names and the meaning. And we'll pray and we'll worship yet again. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh means mortal. Canaan means sorrow. Mahaliel, the blessed God. Jared means shall come down. Enoch, teaching. Methuselah, his death shall bring. Lamech, the despairing. Noah, comfort and rest. So Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. They mean man is appointed mortal, sorrow. The blessed God shall come down teaching. His death shall bring the despairing comfort and rest. Lord, how amazing you are and how amazing your word. And in these passages where so many would just, well, pass through it, Lord, pass over it, not even worry about it or think it would say anything to them. We find such treasure, such insight. And my fervent prayer, Lord, is that every believer here would be hungry for more, for a deeper understanding of you, a greater understanding of your word, more time not just digging in or reading, but contemplating, meditating in the most biblical of ways, chewing on your word, getting every bit of nourishment from it, bathing in it, basking in it. Lord, how amazing you are and how amazing it is that you love such as us. We readily acknowledge tonight that those people that you flooded out and, and took out in the Old Testament and Noah's day. We're not better than them. We're like them, Lord. And, and we know not every single individual was a murderer, but Lord, we know the warning was there and the opportunity existed. And, and in the, the time of judgment, it was disregarded, mocked. So we pray, Lord, for one another, first of all, that you would just grace us with greater insight into you and a a quicker and more radical transformation into people that think and act and respond as you do. So we wouldn't have to ask, what would Jesus do? People would simply look at us and wonder what we're going to do. Make us such a people, Lord. It's dark. It's desperate. The depravity is increasing. The insanity is abounding. And Lord, you are this generation's only hope. You've always been mankind's only hope. So we ask for you to pour your spirit out on us. Fill us to overflowing and use us to glorify you and bring people to you. And Lord... I pray if there'd be even one person here tonight who's hearing these things and processing them fully for the first time, making sense of what never made sense, comprehending what just seemed unclear and and difficult, I pray that those hearts, if there'd be any or many, would be turned to you right now. And that confession of sin will be offered. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We readily acknowledge that tonight, Lord. We're, we know that, that the wages of sin is death. We all have that coming, but the gift of God, everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's what we now look forward to, we who are in Christ Jesus. And if you've never said, Jesus, come into my life, be my Lord, be my Savior, forgive my every sin, I want to give you that opportunity right now. The wages of sin is death. So so listen, don't think of it as like, well, I'm going to die and find out. No, no, you'll die because all sin and all die. But but the condemnation is already a reality. It's not waiting to see how it turns out. It's not going to go well unless you're in Christ Jesus, unless you've come to faith in him and give your life to him. That's what I'd implore you to do tonight surrender your life to the one who gave his life for you. 
I'd ask you if that's your heart's desire to raise your hand and surrender to Jesus who loved you and gave his life for you, died for your sin, buried and risen again. Right now, he offers you the free gift of everlasting life. Anyone tonight, anyone this service, Lord, we look for hands, or I do, when you're looking at hearts. You're the reader of hearts and the changer of hearts. I pray for those tonight, my brothers and sisters that are suffering, that you would comfort them. Those who are struggling, that you'd be their strength. Those who are losing hope, that you would well up within them a new hope in you. Those, Lord, who've lost that they would be looking up and not around, that they'd be looking for what's left and not what's lost. Finally, Lord, just have your way in us, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen.